Let me start this video off with a simple question. Have you ever played a game so boring, so broken, so frustrating and all over the place that you feel as if you've wasted your time by the end of it? For me, that game is Hunt Down the Freeman. I paid £7 for this shit. Hunt Down the Freeman is not a love letter to Half-Life fans, no. It's a punch in the face and a brutal beatdown. It's a fan game notorious for how much of a broken mess it is in terms of story, gameplay and pacing. It's everything a video game should avoid doing if it wants to succeed. Published by Royal Rudius Entertainment, which from I can see, their company has died out in 2020. Their Twitter just consists of the admin trashing the game or posting Half-Life memes and founded by Birkin Denizuren. The idea of Hunt Down the Freeman mainly started off as a concept. An interview with Run Think Shoot Live dissects the thought process of this ambitious concept. Birkin defends the idea of including cutscenes in a Half-Life game. Let me repeat this. Cutscenes in a Half-Life game. You know, the series that is remarkable for giving the player free will even when important story beats are happening. First of all, if someone doesn't like, he can just press escape and... <laughs> Okay. But that will mean that they lose information? It's just some parts that, because, okay, here's the thing. Uh, so many people forget about that. In the all Half-Life games, you play in a timeline that only you pass, you have a journey. Mm -hmm. But in this game, you pass three different timelines. Okay. Yeah. And if you show this without a cutscene, it's it's real not not that okay. great well to tell. It's a lot of money for somebody who hasn't released anything yet. I know a couple of people who have um, who have made some mods, and if they came to me and said, look, I'm trying to make this game, what do you think? I'd say, wow, yeah, a lot of people would support you. But you're coming in as, as an outsider and asking for a huge amount of money. Whether that's justifiable amount of money is irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether it's 10K, 100K, or a million. Nobody knows you, and I think that's one of the problems that people have got. Yeah, the sirens are definitely going off. This shit is a red flag. Okay, so after Tommy Vassetti's yapping, we got a demo in 2016, which was just an edgy man wanting to find Gordon Freeman with over-the-top dialogue, goofy voice acting, and stolen models, with all of that being thrown into some Gmod maps. You think you're so cool with your stick, bullying citizens. You didn't see what I did. My brothers did. The captain did. When I was a child, Combines forced me and the other kids to construct cremator heads. Yeah, the dialogue sounds something straight out of Half-Life Full Life Consequences. It honestly wasn't received all that well. Fast forward to 2018. Bloody hell, that was six years ago. The mod, oh no, sorry, not the mod. The game was released with a price tag meaning that you had to pay actual money to experience this masterpiece. I will never understand how Valve saw this and thought it was good. And let's just say that it wasn't received well at all and completely missed the mark on what it was aiming to be. But even if I pirated this game, I'd probably want my money back. <laughs> what the fuck? Is, man, is there anything this game does even close to right? Just probably know I, I haven't actually been paid as of now, so... As much as I want to have sympathy for these guys, I feel like they've dug their own grave on this one. Uh, yeah, don't buy this game for the meme. Don't, don't, don't even buy it for the meme. Don't buy it for the joke. Ripped assets from fucking think of a shooter in the past 10 years. Uh, as far as I understand, they're not being paid properly. The game legitimately is just broken and you can't continue without no clipping in numerous situations. This is a Gmod map. What the fuck? I've played this. Yeah, this was a little- oh. Bye. Hold on, I'm gonna dust these off here. Fucking wrong! This game started as a mistake and never stopped making them. It takes a complete dump on the Half-Life community, as phenomenal projects such as Black Mesa and Entropy Zero are now in the same category as this mess. During this time, I was watching tons and tons of videos of people just complaining about this game. It was honestly entertaining just how bad a game made on the Source engine can be. This game makes Half-Life Source look like a godsend, and if you haven't noticed, YouTubers were hired to cast most of the voices. H-E-C-U. What are special forces doing here? My fellow Americans. The aliens are coming. We've been compromised. Let it out, Corporal. Oh, Colonel. 
We are so fucked. For fuck's sake, man. So to understand the horror stories, I went into the 2018 retail release version of this game, thinking it would be a fun bad game to review, and I can confidently say, with chess, that it is the worst experience I've had with a Source game. Not even just a Source game, any game in general. I wanted to play this game to dissect the mind of Birkin and what his goals were. This video will be split up into three portions. The story of the game, the gameplay from the initial 2018 release, and how it pairs up in comparison to the modern version of Hunt Down the Freeman. Which in all honesty, the difference is quite surprising. Here's the respective timestamps of these portions. Now let's begin. God help us. No. God will stay away from this one. The concept of this game sounds pretty cool. It's an entirely separate perspective of a marine who was sent to Black Mesa. Most of the game is also set within the Seven Hour War. You know, the war that determined the fate of humanity in the hands of the Combine. It also has unique weapons and your character is essentially an anti-villain, neither good or bad in terms of his goals. Now all of that sounds promising on paper, but in execution, it falls on its arse. The game starts off with a rather promising cutscene of our main protagonist, Mitchell, who after living a life of misery, joins the armed forces, with the G-Man playing a major factor in this. How do I know this? Because you can see him like, three or four times in the cutscene. This cutscene is honestly a good start to the game and builds a bit of foundation on who our protagonist is, and that's the only positive thing I can say for now, so be prepared for this upcoming train wreck. Mitchell is then thrown straight into the heart of Black Mesa as the Resonance Cascade is taking place, with him kindly hugging a Black Ops assassin. He makes his way through Black Mesa and discovers that all of his comrades have been slaughtered. It is here where he's ambushed by Gordon Freeman, because Gordon always wore his helmet through Black Mesa, right? Kind of deceptive on the marketing here, Birkin, not gonna lie mate. The G-Man saves his life and forces him into a deal, but Mitchell's end of the deal is not revealed yet, only the fact that he has to keep his promise. And I can't lie, the voice acting for the G-Man here is pretty accurate. He has most of his mannerisms, but cannot pronounce Black Mesa for the life of him. For the half-life of him. Black Mesa. Black Mesa. But luckily, the voice actor did redo his lines and beat the allegations, so that's good. Alive from Black Mesa. Mitchell is now awoken in the middle of the Seven Hour War, in which he meets a dude who I hate everything voices. His name? Uh, I can't even remember his name. Uh, what is it? Nick. But we'll call him the multilingual man because he changes accents halfway through the game for some reason. There is no easy way to put it, but as far as we know, we're under an alien invasion. Whoa, 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 slow down. Reach the Combine? Gordon Freeman? Also, Bro needs to sue his barber because what the hell, man? He also meets up with a shady motherfucker named Adam, and seriously, who talks like this? I heard that you guys have a plan about getting out of the city. Maybe. I went in. Why? Hey, let's make a deal. Heading down into a subway, we meet the best character in the game. Well, well, look who we got here, boys. A black ops and a marine. Hoorah. This is Colonel Q, or Sir. This dude is honestly the only redeeming quality of this game, I swear. They said you have a plan to get out of the city? That's right, we do have a plan. We'll run away. If your mother was alive, she'd be proud of you, son. My mother's dead? I think he's the only self-aware character in this game, because even the voice actor must have caught on to how bad this was going to be. Not only are we given the best character in Hunt Down the Freeman, but then given the best cutscene in the game right after. Colonel, you need to see this. It's the president. My fellow Americans. As your president and commander-in-chief, it is with a heavy heart that I'm informing you that we have made a strategic decision to surrender to the alien invaders known as the Combine. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. I never voted for this guy. I guess you don't understand the situation, my friend. We're all dead men walking. 
Oh my goodness. This was supposed to be one of the more emotional portions of the game, but I was laughing the entire way through. It's so iconic for how unserious the announcement of the submission of humanity in the hands of the Combine really is. If this is your first Half-Life game, I'm so sorry. So the group forge an idea that since the Combine have complete reign over lands, the sea would be the only way to stay out of their sight, with Colonel Q unfortunately meeting his end through the process. Don't you dare call this man a fraud. Colonel Q? Dead. Shit. He was always a tough bastard. Toughest son of a bitch I ever knew. After boarding the ship, they meet the captain and Nick suddenly snaps at Mitchell for being cursed since everybody above him in the chain of command dies. This conflicting thought is never brought up again and that captain dies a minute later. So, yeah. It does kind of prove his claim. You made a deal with the devil. Yeah, you have it. There's a black screen and an exposition dump on how the Combine have taken over the world, basically where the events of Half-Life 2 begin with. We're now in... Alaska? Mitchell infiltrates a Combine factory and meets a dude called Boris. He has a daughter and runs this Combine facility with child workers. He single-handedly takes the place down and recruits these motherfuckers in his army. I'm gonna burn the whole factory to the ground and take those kids with me. You will do this for the children? Well, I will but not for the children. I need an army. We're then reminded that this game is all about hunting down Gordon Freeman. Someone is caught with a crowbar on the ship and gives Mitchell PTSD, which the G-Man takes advantage of and reminds him of his end of the deal, which is to game end Freeman. He then teams up with the Combine and invades Black Mesa East, somewhat connecting the timeline in Half-Life 2. He fails and is now captured by the rebels, only to be freed by Boris's daughter, who gets game-ended by Adam for some reason. This means that the Combine are now hunting after Mitchell. So Adam betrays Mitchell during the escape and the G-Man reveals that he was the one who was wearing the head suit that day and took Mitchell down since he gave him a deal too. Who would have saw that coming? Wow, it wasn't Gordon Freeman. I'm so shocked. I'm so flabbergasted. So yeah, Mitchell was used by Adam and the G-Man. And what's the G-Man's motivations for keeping a close eye on Mitchell and forcing him into this deal? Well, he reveals that he wanted Mitchell's debauchery to have the Combine divide their forces into focusing on him in order to give Gordon Freeman an easier journey to the Citadel. So with that context, he expected Mitchell to team up with the Combine at one point, only to have Adam betray him when the time came. Mitchell then heads back to his ship where he finds Adam and delivers one of the best lines in gaming history. Mitchell, look, I can explain. You lied to me. No, that wasn't the deal. He he told me. Mitch, please. You betrayed me. You used me. You fucked up my face. And now, Mitch, please. I I can explain. You have my permission to die. He then lands a headshot on Adam through aiming his revolver down and... Turn the ship. We're going to Borealis. Oh, they really thought that this was going to pop off. So yeah, that is the story of Hunt Down the Freeman. My apologies for the IQ loss. If you thought that was bad, let's have a look at... Fire in the hall! Oh my god, where do I begin with this mess? Since I wanted to play the game in its purest form, everything looked fine to me, but OBS was having a terrible time. If I'm colliding with any object or NPC, including the ground, it looks like I've been consumed by the shadows. Cutscenes also depict the shadows of my last view before they trigger, so every single one of my cutscenes look like a 2015 MOG montage. The tutorial alone gives you a gist of the quality of this game. Oh my god, my eyes. Like seriously, they could have at least put a bloody background here. This section is basically a discount version of the Opposing Force tutorial. Like, is this what joining the military is actually like to these people? Yes, sir! 
these same two models are just copy and pasted and look so dead inside. So I moved on and oh my god, what is this view, Bobby? Yeah, we're turning that off straight away. If you thought that was nauseating, just have a look at the climbing animations. There was also a terrible choice to put the ability to climb on a separate keybind. So you have to put away your weapon to make an attempt to claw up a wall. They literally could have just had you automatically mount ledges like the game Dying Light. I mean, even Fortnite has this, but I'll give them the benefit of the doubt since this is running on the Source engine. I learned how to jump, climb, use weapons, night vision, which is also its own weapon for some reason, and then... Oh damn. Okay. That's exactly how most levels tend to end. A jarring cut to a cutscene or just fading to black. The majority of the assets of this game are completely yoinked from existing titles and they're not even trying to hide it. The guns have punchy sound effects which is good but the recoil and aim down sights suck ass. And it doesn't even help that the majority of the weapons are weak as hell and feel like you're shooting peanuts. I think the only new enemy varieties in this game are these overgrown watermelons that look like they belong in Five Nights at Freddy's. They're ripped straight from the Half-Life 2 beta concept art, which doesn't sound all that bad on paper since the first half of the game takes place during the 7 hour war, but these guys are complete dumbasses. If they have their back turned to you, they admit defeat and let you end them. They're just a reskin of the Combine soldiers you fight in the retail Half-Life 2, but uglier, and taller, and stupider, and green. Then you have the reskinned mana hacks that explode once you touch them. Who thought of this idea? Then there's the blue antlions. Antlions, but blue. Your allies are also complete imbeciles and have the IQ of a goldfish. The majority of these levels have no sense of direction whatsoever. You're just expected to know where to go in order to progress, which completely goes against Valve's way of level design. Their philosophy includes linear routes that feel spatial but subtly guide the player whether it be by lights or stashes of goods. It's either that or they grant you a subtle tutorial, subconsciously giving you the knowledge to improve your gameplay and combat encounters. With Hunt Down the Peakman, there's nothing here. Let me give you an example. There's a gate here that you cannot pass. Okay then, we'll go into this small rundown shop and pick up a knife along the way. Perhaps traversing through the shop is the answer as there's a small opening down here and luckily I can go prone. Nah, that's not the case bro. You're supposed to backtrack and head back to this gate that has the tiniest lock I've ever seen. You'd expect that with a literal battle happening just a couple of paces up, they would have strong Stronger, more obvious reinforcement than a tiny padlock. What made the padlock effective in Half-Life 2 is the fact that it was always in closed spaces and a lot more obvious to detect. With this there was just no indication that I was supposed to slash it with a knife as there is a literal opening I can go through within the shop. <sighs> Okay, so right after there's an open war zone and there are soldiers just mindlessly shooting at the combine. You'd expect a holdout section where you stay here and clear out the area, but this is absolutely pointless. You realise that 5 minutes into doing this that they're just infinitely spawning and you can just run right past them and head into this alleyway. And that's just how most combat encounters are in Hunt Down the Soyman. It's all smoke and mirrors to make you believe that you're doing something, but you're better off getting more entertainment by a dupe on Gary's mod. Also, the combat with these things are just dry as hell. They're just bullet sponges. Sure, the weapons sound punchy, but what's the point in actually immersing yourself in this if the devs don't even care? It completely takes out the immersion of the game when the main strategy is to just ignore all the enemies. And this is the majority of the game. It's so frustrating and just not enjoyable at all. This portion pissed me off to the core. There's a platform with a couple of sandbags, so the reasonable course of action would be to clunkily pop parkour on top of it, right? Yes. Well then, where do you go from here? There are sandbags blocking your path and there's an invisible wall. Okay, so maybe I can parkour on top of this for more height. Nah. There's also a strider stuck in a walking animation that's constantly firing at you so you have to move quickly before it chunks you down. I eventually found myself getting over the sandbags in a corner here and got completely stuck and the parkour mechanic is incredibly unresponsive and unoptimized that I just couldn't even get out, soft locking myself. And so the only reasonable thing to do was to just no clip out of there and are you f 
fucking shitting me. This is even worse. You're supposed to defend a train from gunships and are equipped with a minigun. I'm convinced that this is just here to pad out the time of the game because you don't even have to take on the gunships. Just wait for them to destroy all the carriages of the train before heading back down the ladder. I'd be shocked to know they playtested this before release. There's also no indication here that I had flares whatsoever so I just turned up my brightness before trying to move through these caves. A small prompt for a mechanic that I've used once in the game before would have been helpful. Like come on Birkin, you're making me mad now bro. Stop it. Look at this. Three separate maps with loading screens and all of them have you aimlessly running around in the hopes that the level will fade to black. It's genuinely baffling how they approved of this. At one point I would treat the game with the same effort the way the devs have and just use no clip and god mode to get past most of the broken levels because I genuinely had no idea where I was going. Some of these levels are also missing textures and are just borderline unplayable. There's also this funny ass sequence I'll just let it play out. That is a rich offer indeed. Please, excuse me for a little while. Yeah, you actually have to wait for him. Peak gameplay. There's also this sequence that is just driving a motorbike down the road and that's literally it. Next loading screen. The only portion of this build that I liked was the chapter where you're invading Black Mesa East and going through the aftermath of Ravenholm after the arrival of Gordon Freeman. The City 17 chapter was okay, but what do these three have in common? They're ripped straight from Half-Life 2 and somehow look worse than the base game, but for once it felt as if progression was happening in this game. That's the only props I can give it. And they had the audacity to make the final level a 15 minute holdout section. My my game crashed halfway so when I reloaded back in there was no timer so I just had to pray that it was still counting down. I guess what I can conclude from all these complaints is the fact that it's laughably unfinished and just plain boring. I was playing this all in one day and when the game got past its halfway mark I just wanted to get it over and done with. What the fuck? So how does this game hold up in 2024? What were the changes made? Well, there's quite a lot, and they're all positive too. Some levels have been completely scrapped, whilst others have been reworked from the ground up. Weapons and NPC models have also been updated. Puzzles are a lot easier to go through, and the game looks more visually pleasing too. Like holy shit, some of these overhauls are actually quite impressive. And the game is actually in a playable state. I experienced no crashes, and the levels flowed a lot better than fading to black or having sudden cuts. Cutscenes have also been remade for certain portions of the game when you compare it to the old ones and you can really tell that the devs at Mesa build really wanted to fix this mess and they're definitely having fun with it as all the achievements are literally taking the piss out of the game. There's also a level that features a work in progress code and it seems that they're taking their sweet time in fixing this which I'm honestly all for. I remember playing some of these portions and actually being very impressed with the overhaul. An example is the factory section. In the original build you just walk into the building. Here there's an actual puzzle that has you utilizing the parkour mechanic, which is solid. The majority of the issues regarding the gameplay portions of this game have been completely ironed out. Combat encounters feel as if they have some weight to them and the enemies are placed more sparsely and tactically instead of being huddled up in a group. View bobbing was off on default so that was a plus too. Some lines and their deliveries have also been swapped around as well as entire cutscenes being remade in Source Filmmaker. I couldn't really find any flaws in the gameplay of this one, but that could have been because I was blinded by the rush of actually playing a fixed game. The portion with the minigun is cut out and the ending level has totally changed, with you starting off with parkouring your way through the building as well as solving some puzzles. You then set up turrets at more challenging angles so you can't cheese your way through it like the original ending. The 15 minutes are now 4 minutes and the minigun battle with the gunships was actually reused for this portion which makes it a lot more climactic as an ending sequence and a reward for choring through this game. So yeah, yeah. Compared to how this game was 6 years ago, it's improved greatly and is actually worth playing in all honesty. To which, you probably should if you're interested, I mean, these people are fixing a mess. Hero? <laughs> you're talking to a villain, my dear. The hero inside of me died, 
many, many years ago when I was young. To be honest, as terrible as the gameplay was at the time, the story does have some interesting concepts and ideas that were executed in the worst way possible. The idea of Mitchell slowly losing his sanity and morals all for the sake of the revenge he's chasing for a man who doesn't even know him could have been done a lot better. At the end of the day, he's an anti-villain who is unable to distinguish right and wrong the more power he achieves and becomes irredeemable. As cringy as it sounds, they honestly could have gone the Breaking Bad route and had him become unlikable as the story goes on, but there just isn't enough substance to care about him or any of the characters. The dialogue in cutscenes is completely irrelevant to the progression of the story in most instances, with a sentence or two being only worthwhile. It doesn't even do well to build any characters besides Mitchell in the slightest. Everything just feels like filler. There was literally no indication that Adam was going to play a major part in the story. When the plot deems him worthy close to the end, they just shove him into it. Mitchell quite literally goes from a soldier who met unfortunate events to an edgelord justifying enslaving children. His motivations for Gordon could have been a lot better too. Rather than losing to a 1v1 and crying about it for about 30 years, he could have had a more emotional set piece to solidify his hate rather than just walking into a room and seeing his comrades in arms splurged in jelly. The cutscenes honestly aren't all that bad at all, but the over the top, goofy and nonsensical writing weighs it down. The voice acting does not help either, with terrible audio mixing. In my opinion, this could have been just a movie made with Source Filmmaker. It didn't have to be a game, since let's be honest, that's the main problem with this mess. They could have completely removed the game aspect from this game, and with a little bit of tweaking to the script and hiring, you know, professional voice actors, this could have received monumental praise for being something ambitious within the Source and Half-Life community. Oh my god, I've been playing this game for so long that I'm trying to defend what it could have been. As mentioned before, the Mesa team is now in charge of fixing this mess and they've done a really good job in all fairness, making the game into a more playable, fun bad rather than the horrid 2018 retail release build. In conclusion, the colossal disappointment and insult that was Hunt Down the Freeman could have been easily avoided if they put more time into the project instead of shipping it out as soon as they could. I'm happy that the Mesa team is fixing this mess, but that unfortunately won't reverse the damage that Hunt Down the Freeman has had within the community. But when looking at it in today's date, the scenario is just funny as fuck. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. I'll see you guys in the next one. You fucked up my face. <laughs>